In this tutorial, I'll show you how to use the deformable model that we created to establish point correspondence between meshes. Hi, and welcome to Coding with Dennis. My name is Dennis. This here is the fifth tutorial in the series on how to create statistical shape models. In this tutorial, we'll first manually code up a model fitting function to understand all the aspects of what goes into non-rigid registration using the Gaussian process framework and the Scalismo library. At first, load in a model and a target mesh. Before doing so, be sure to have executed step one and two in the, in the source prepared data folder, as this will first align all your target data and then create the model to use. Since the target data in this example is very noisy, our goal is not to do a perfect fit, but instead to capture the overall size of the target data. Since we have landmark points available, both for the model and the target mesh, we can start out trying to fit the model to these landmark points. This is done using the model.posterior function. Internally, Gaussian process regression is used to calculate the model condition on the landmark observations that we provided it. For some applications, this here might be good enough. We can even continue adding more landmarks to get the surfaces closer and closer together. You might also want to play around with the uncertainty value when calculating the posterior. This value should be seen as the uncertainty of the landmark observation. So when working with Scalismo, everything is in millimeters. So the uncertainty of one means a one standard deviation of one millimeter. Instead of adding more landmarks, we want to find the corresponding points automatically. To do so, we'll implement a form of iterative closest point algorithm or ICP for short. This function uses the same principles as above to calculate the posterior model, given some observations and then we take the most likely shape, in other words, the mean from the distribution as our next step. To find the corresponding points, we simply estimate this to be the closest point on the target surface. To begin with, we can then assign a large uncertainty value to our observations. The idea is then to iteratively move the model closer to the target mesh by estimating new corresponding points in each iteration and lowering the uncertainty at the same time. To begin with, I'll just show a very simple implementation method that has the same structure as the rigid ICP alignment we saw in Scalismo Tutorial 2. We define our non-rigid ICP function, which takes in the model and a target mesh, the number of sample points and the number of iterations, exactly like the rigid ICP method. The function should then return a triangulated mesh, which is an instance of the model that is fitted to the target. We then create a recursive function that has the moving mesh, an uncertainty variable, and also the iteration counter. We now need to estimate the corresponding points from the moving mesh and the target mesh. This we code up in another function called attribute correspondence. In here, we simply loop over the chosen point IDs from the moving mesh and then find the closest point on the target. So what we return is the point ID from the moving mesh or the model itself and the point on the target mesh. We can now again compute the posterior model based on all these estimated correspondences and use the mean value as the next moving step in our iterations here. So a ton of configuration possibilities exist for the ICP algorithm. For instance, how the closest points are taken, which is calculated in the attribute correspondence function. This could be either the closest Euclidean point on the target surface, the closest vertex on the target surface, as done in the example, it could also be the closest point along the surface normal. We could also estimate the closest point from the target to the model instead, like taking it the other way around. And many, many more methods exist to make it more robust. The same goes for the uncertainty value, which can either be manually set for all corresponding pairs, or we can come up with a way to calculate the uncertainty based on the distance, for instance, between the model surface and the target surface for each point. When running the fitting, we can either make use of the original model, so the GPMM model, or we can make use of a model that is conditioned on the landmark observation that we already did in the start of this tutorial. To evaluate the fit to the target, some common metrics to use are the average distance and the house of distance. These can be used to quickly get an idea about the quality of the fit. So let's make a small evaluation function that prints out these values. Now let's compare the fit from only using the provided landmarks and the fit from additionally running the fitting function, the non-rigid ICP function. In this case, we should see that the fiddle model improves uh, on both aspects. But just as mentioned in the previous video, remember 
to visually inspect the results as well. Next, let's make use of a framework that already has some of these functions implemented, namely Ginger. This is a framework built on top of Scalismo, which implements some of the more sophisticated ways to perform non-rigid registration. And here, full disclosure, I'm one of the maintainers of the repository, which is based on my PhD thesis. The main principles behind the Ginger framework are exactly what we went through in the manual example that we coded up. We need to select a deformable model for the fitting. Then we need to decide how the corresponding points are being estimated in each iteration. And finally, we need to set the observation uncertainty. The framework already comes with multiple different examples on how to perform fitting, but also automatic methods to calculate the model. In the script on the repository, prepare data, uh, and the step number three, registration, I've made use of the Ginger framework, where I make use of the coherent point drift implementation. This method here is very good in correcting minor rigid alignment offsets between the model and the target, as well as giving a cause fit to the data. As our data is very, very noisy, I'm already stopping after a cause fit, as we would otherwise just start explaining the noise in the data with our model. But let's now try to run the example from the Ginger repository to get a feeling of how it could be used to fit very close to the target. For this, let's look at the multi-resolution demo. This demo first solves a small rigid offset in the target mesh, as well as giving a rough fitting using the coherent point drift implementation. Notice how we use run decimated instead of run. Internally, this method will decimate both the model and the target mesh to speed up the fitting. In the second step, we use a less decimated model, but still using the same fitting method. Finally, we switch to the iterative closest point algorithm as explained in the start of this tutorial. We'll do an additional step with the full resolution to fit all the intricate details of the mesh. And now let's look at the average distance and the max distance after each of the three steps. And here, by no means are all these steps necessary in all the cases. Always start with a simple model and one of the methods and try to identify what areas can be proved. Also, if speed is not an issue, you can of course skip decimating the meshes and just use the complete meshes. If you would like to learn more about the technical aspects of Ginger, I've also put a white paper out which you can find on Archive. I'll put a link to this in the description of the video as well. And that's the end of the practical steps to create your first statistical shape model. The most crucial part is to look at your data and from there decide how, for instance, the current parameters need to look like, as well as the noise assumption during the fitting stage. If the data set is very noisy, it does not make sense to create a model with thousands of basis functions that perfectly fit the data. And likewise, if you have perfectly clean data, you need to add enough basis functions to your model for it to be able to describe all the data in detail. And now the remaining tutorials, they are focused on model evaluation and different ways to visualize your created statistical shape model. In the next tutorial, I'll go over typical evaluation metrics that are used to evaluate your statistical shape model. That was all for this video. Remember to give the video a like, comment below with your own shape model project, and of course, subscribe to the channel for more content like this. See you in the next video.